All right, so uh, we talked about the origins of the modernist movement you know, in Europe. Um, and in fact, Frank Lloyd Wright, as we see here um, with his falling water, um, being a, an early inspiration to the architects, especially in Germany, that would um, really begin the modernist movement there um, after looking at his Vosmuth portfolio. Um, he left Oak Park in 1909, uh, went to Europe with the wife of his client, and uh, you know, put together that portfolio, which was widely distributed in Europe, um, and sort of ended his prairie-style career, ended his life here in Oak Park. Uh, he would carry on. Um, he had some work in the teens, as we'll see, and in the 20s, but then he, you know, he sort of began to fade a little bit before a resurgence. So modern, as, as, as we talked about last time, modernism, you know, had really arose in Europe, especially out of Germany with like the Bauhaus. Um, and we, it was the 1920s, we start to see um, a little bit of that happening in the U.S., especially in Southern California, which was a, um, by the 1920s, was a really popular um, region of the country as a still remains. Uh, people were, were flocking there for, you know, any number of reasons, including uh, wonderful weather and climate and the, um, you know, Hollywood was setting up, you know, shop there, you know, by the 20s, you know, with the silent movies, you know, and would become a massive industry um, as, as um, the film industry evolved. Um, and so there was, you know, a fair amount of wealth there as well. So, you know, people with money can afford, you know, great architecture, as we've talked about throughout, not just this semester, but last semester as well. So, um, and, you know, if Wright was an early leader in Chicago with the sort of uh, prairie school here in Chicago, and he was an early inspiration with the Vosmuth portfolio for the European architects that would go into modernism, he was also an early leader in the modernist movement in Southern California, um, and actually wound up having several key projects there in the 1920s um, that would help spur um, a, a movement, modernist movement of architecture there. Um, and then we'll talk about here shortly, in 1932, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, MoMA, um, put together an exhibition of modernist architecture. And that really is what kind of launches modernism in the United States and really sort of spreads it to a broader audience. Um, and then, as we'll talk later, and probably not today, but um, we'll be talking later about how it really explodes, this movement of architecture just you know, massively explodes all across the country and spreads across the world in the post-World War II um, era. So let's start with Wright and with California and uh, a series of houses that are known as the textile block houses. Uh, these are in the Los Angeles area, um, generally between 1921 and 1924. Um, and it's an era when, you know, Wright still has a fair amount of work. Um, he's actually, around this time, he's, he's doing a major hotel in Tokyo, Japan, uh, which is keeping him pretty busy and, and um, making a number of site visits there. But um, it also allows him, um, he has enough time that he's doing um, some key projects in the L.A. area. Uh, and the first one technically isn't a textile block house, but it's kind of the originator of that. And I'll explain what I mean by textile block in a moment. But uh, And that's the Aline Barnsdale House, also known as uh, Hollyhock, Hollyhock House. Uh, this is from 1921. This is his first project in, uh, in it's literally in Los Angeles. It's his first project in Southern California. Uh, Aline Barnsdale was a wealthy um, woman who... Um, uh, was a um, supporter of the arts and culture in the Los Angeles area. She had a uh, almost like a, a an entire hillside. Uh, you know, L LA has a number of mountains around it, but this was a, a small little mountain or small hill in near Hollywood, and it um, 
um, she had the entire site and she wanted to create not only a house for herself, but she really wanted to create an entire cultural complex. Um, and, and even today, she left it, ultimately left it to the city of Los Angeles. And today it is a, a park and the house is a house museum open for tours and it's been really nicely restored. Um, so what we're seeing here, I think you can hopefully immediately tell that this is nothing like the prairie style architecture that he had developed um, around 1900. So 20 years later, he's on to something different. Um, he's really all but left um, the, the forms and the sort of character of prairie style behind. There are certain things that he carries on, such as open floor plans and his use of space and and progression, you know, is uh, the way you move through a building and then across a site. Those things remain, but um, you know, we we no longer see the hipped roofs and the wide overhanging eaves and the um, the there, there's a fair amount of horizontality here, but it isn't the driving force. There's a lot of um, vertical elements as we see um, around the window element here um, and the. The roof, it's, you know, we're in LA, we don't have snow loads. <laughs> uh, there's not even a ton of rain most of the time. Uh, and so uh, you can do more flat roofs. So we see more of a parapet with a, almost a canted uh, parapet here. Um, a lot of people compare this uh, and think that he was heavily influenced by Mayan architecture, which we talked about last fall, if you remember that a little bit. And um, there's, there's probably something to, if he was influenced by Japanese architecture, couple of you missed that on the quiz. Uh, he was heavily influenced by Japanese architecture um, in his prairie style. Um, it, he most likely was heavily influenced by Mayan architecture, which um, in, in this era. And Mayan architecture was sort of being rediscovered by this time. And there was a lot of press and literature about that and the details and the ornament and so forth. So we see definitely some of that here. It's called Hollyhock House because he uses the Hollyhock plant as the kind of driving theme uh, for the sort of my ornament and stuff. And in fact, um, the decoration, I think I have a closer photo here shortly, but the decorations here that we see are geometric abstractions of the Hollyhock. Here we have a detail. There's a Hollyhock up there in the front. And then you see his geometric abstraction of that. Um, you know, some of you might see some similarities and think this compares to Unity Temple. Um, so, you know, there is some of that. And of course, Unity Temple really wasn't a, a true prairie style building either. He was beginning to sort of break away from some of that with the way he was doing his ornament and the massing and structure here. So there is some carryover um, in many ways to um, to Unity Temple here. This is not a concrete building. It's It's stucco. Um, but it has that same look, that monolithic look to it. Um, and again, these are the kinds of things that the European architects were um, really interested as well. Monolithic surfaces, geometric massing, um, more so than they were in the sort of forms of the prairie style. This is a... Um, view of the gardens in behind here with a beautiful sort of courtyard or reflecting pool. When you're in LA, you can have a lot of outdoor space, right? Um, more, more outdoor living than we can do here. Uh, so we'll start to see much more of this kind of character where you can have a lot of gardens and courtyards and fountains. And then some views of the interior that I took um, when I visit. I've been in here a couple of times now. Um, and it's, it's got a lot of the original furniture uh, similar interiors, frankly, to his prairie style. He still has a lot of the woodwork, uh, almost still some of the autumnal colors, the, you, know, call, you know, the warm browns and reds and golden colors that you see in the fall in the prairie. Um, he's, he's using that a little bit here as well. Uh, but he's also using some of this um, masonry and stucco uh, in, on the interior, bringing that on the inside, not just using uh, regular finishes. Here's the dining room uh, with a very weird dining room fixture. That's actually an historic reproduction of, of what it was. But uh, a little bit of, you know, very uncomfortable looking chairs, but a lot of woodwork still inside. We still see some leaded glass windows like he had done with the prairie style. So the interiors still just have a, a little more of a carryover. This is the living room. 
uh, with this really massive fireplace. He still believes in the hearth being the heart of the home, so he has this massive fireplace. Um, again, something you really wouldn't need in LA probably at all, much less you know in the 1920s, certainly not for heating, but it becomes a focal point, uh, especially with this carved stone uh, decorative element uh, over the mantle, it really becomes a feature here, uh, a design feature. And we're starting to see in this mantle some of the geometric um, um, geometries that he would really embrace uh, later in his career. But over on the right, we see uh, almost a Japanese-style silkscreen uh, soji panels, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of things going on here in this house. It's a really fascinating house. I encourage you sometime when you're in LA, um, definitely um, to, to go visit that. So the next house I want to talk about is the Alice Millard house, uh, known colloquially as La Miniatura. Uh, this is in Pasadena, which is, you know, a suburb of LA itself, and this is from 1923. Um, this is a true textile blockhouse, and I'll show you, you know, in the detailed photos. What this means is um, these are actual concrete blocks that have a decorative form in them, and then they're assembled together to create um, the exterior walls. Whereas Hollyhock House um, was, you know, monolithic. It was, you know, framed with stucco. Just like we've seen, you, you know, you see them all around there. This is, you know, pieced together as masonry, and the um, blocks were generally made on site or by the contractor um, locally and used uh, these decorative forms. And it was something he was experimenting with. You know, people hadn't, you know, concrete block was a common building material by then, uh, but it was used for foundations, you know, it was cheaper than stone or brick or something like that. So um, we started seeing a lot of concrete block foundations, but to use concrete block as the finished wall, well, that wasn't something people were doing. And to use it, as we'll see momentarily, as the interior finished wall was really radical. So these were, these were really experimental and radical designs um, from their era. And interestingly, Alice Millard uh, was the widow of um, uh, George Millard. The two of them had Wright design them a prairie style house in 1906 up in Highland Park on the North Shore, which I actually restored uh, a few years ago. Um, and then uh, he died and she moved to LA and hired Wright in 1923 to design her her LA house. So uh, there's there's kind of a carryover from the prairie style to um, to this new textile style of the 1920s. So these are views of the entry area. It's a very private house. Um, uh, I took these photos just from the basically from the street. Uh, there was even a sign hidden that said, you know, you know, no no trespassing, and you know, don't even try knocking on the door and stuff like that, because obviously a lot of architects uh, like to come and look at this. So um, these are the only photos I could take, but I'll show you some other published photos uh, of the interior. But here you can see um, the individual blocks with this kind of cruciform shape on them, and some of them are hollow, um, you know, or the, the cruciform is, is you know, trans parent and those create you know light openings or ventilation openings into the house and so um, the front of the house is pretty blah you know it's it's it, it the main you know view and vista is on the back side which is it sits on the top of a ravine and so it's a much more dramatic view um, from the rear side but um, this these are the photos I could take from the front getting some nice details of the textile blocks. So here's a model of it, and you can see how it dramatically sits in this ravine. So I was taking photos up here in the upper left, you know, looking just at this front part, but really the house opens up, you know, in three dimensions uh, in the ravine area itself. And I think I have some photos of that. Yeah, here's, uh, here's more of a view um, showing the house as it spreads out across the landscape. You know, you're in LA, so you've got fish ponds, you've got, you know, lots of foliage, and it's, you know, really a uh, open um, open landscape here. So here's an interior view of the living room. And as we can see, he is using these same textile blocks as the interior wall surface as well. Um, so this, like I say, this is a radical design innovation to, you know, concrete, you know, 
to use concrete block it, to create it decoratively and to use it as the interior wall surface uh, was something that you know hadn't really been done and wasn't much copied <laughs> you know I, I think most people don't really want their interior walls to be you know concrete block no matter how decorative they are and they had some serious um, they had some serious weathering issues. Uh, this this house has been well maintained, but there's a couple of these textile blocks houses that are in really bad condition because the the concrete block absorbed a lot of water, and then the iron, you know, reinforcing rusted, and and there's there's a lot of deterioration in some of these houses. But here, a view of the living room showing the fireplace. Uh, there's a there's a mezzanine balcony. There here you can just make out. Uh, sort of center left, a couple of those cruciform shapes that are open so light is coming through to create kind of an interesting, interesting lighting effect there. All right. So um, the next person I want to talk about is uh, Rudolf Schindler. So Schindler was from Vienna. And he became familiar with Frank Lloyd Wright through the Wasmuth portfolio. So, um, and that inspired him to want to immigrate to the United States. He actually came to Chicago. He met Frank Lloyd Wright up at Taliesin, where he had moved up in southern Wisconsin. And he and he said, "Hey, you know," he basically showed up on his doorstep and said, "Hey, I saw your Wasmuth portfolio, and I moved to America, and here I am. I'm ready to work for you." <laughs> Um, so, you know, that's the kind of effect that he had on people. Um, and so Wright said, well, okay, I'm doing this work in LA and on this, on this project called Hollyhock House. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Wisconsin. I'm traveling to Japan. You know, I'm doing all this stuff. I'm too busy to be on site in LA. So, he, you know, I'll give you a job. You can move to LA and you'll oversee, you know, the construction of Hollyhock House. And so that's what he does. He moves to Southern California and he works for Wright for a short time overseeing construction. He actually makes quite a few modifications uh, because Wright's not around and um, uh, Schindler almost essentially takes over uh, and some of the design elements that are in the house are Schindler's work actually. Uh, and then after the you know project's done, Schindler's like, okay, you know, I'll just start off on my own. And so he settles in LA and um, begins his career there. And one of uh, the most important works that he does is his own house. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna see more and more of architects own houses here. And it's a really innovative um, construction here. This is a nice view of it. Uh, there's a lot of Frank Lloyd Wright's influence here, but he's also experimenting in his own ways with space and with materials as well. Here is an axiometric view, and hopefully the first thing you notice is how it sprawls across the site. Uh, it's essentially a pinwheel design. Remember, we talked about that with the prairie style houses, uh, that there'd be a central hub and then wings that sort of, you know, fan out from that central hub point, often with a fireplace at the central hub. And, um, you know, we saw it being used like Walter Gropius at the Bauhaus. Uh, and here we get again with Schindler with his own house. Um, so there's definitely a carryover of some of those planning principles that you know Schindler and these others learned from Wright's Vosma portfolio. But the innovation was that this is a precast concrete tilt-up wall construction. Um, this is something that is pretty common today, uh, especially in warehouses. If if you drive past or out towards the Triton campus, right, the new Amazon facility there on North Avenue, um, that's pretty much, you know, you see that all across, you know, the far flung. If you drive out, you know, I-55 or, you know, some of the other uh, expressways and stuff as you get out of the city, um, you see these massive, you know, warehouse buildings. They're all precast tilt up construction. Um, they're quick, they're cheap, they're easy to make. This is one of the very, very first uses of that technology. Um, Schindler um, made these himself on site. He created forms on the ground. He cast, you know, poured his concrete panels uh, right there on the ground, broke the forms once the um, 
concrete had set, broke the forms and had help and he just lifted the panels up into place. Uh, and it was kind of a cheap, easy way for him to build his own house. Uh, but it was a really innovative technology um, uh, for the time. And this is a, a historic view of it. Uh, when uh, the site at that time was basically out in the middle of nowhere with orange groves around it, and you could see the mountains, you know, off in the distance. Uh, now it's just completely surrounded. This is really uh, almost in the Hollywood neighborhood, and it is completely surrounded by, you know, you know, large buildings and all of that now. So it, it doesn't look anything like this anymore. As you can see, here's a more temporary view. I got to visit this a couple of years ago. Uh, so here you can see the, some of the tilt-up panels. Uh, he actually has them canted slightly. They're at an angle. They're not perfectly vertical. So that creates a kind of an interesting design effect. And then between the panels at the seams, he allows a little reveal for slivers of light to come through. And then some of the rest of the area is all open glass walls. So he's really got a combination here of these solid concrete walls and these open glazed areas using a lot of glass, a lot of natural light and ventilation. So. Um, sort of breaking out a little bit. He's, there's a lot of influence of right here, but he's also experimenting and kind of striking out on his own too. So here's an interior view. Um, it, you can see the way on the left, the way that window wall can be fully opened up. Uh, we saw that a little bit, right, with Corbu at the Via Savoy. He had those giant glazed partitions that could be opened up. We saw it uh, at the Tugendhat House by Mies van der Rohe, where those giant plate glass windows could slide open. Uh, here we see an equivalent of it um, uh, where you can just slide open an entire panel of wall. And in LA, it's beautiful. You know, most times of the year, you can just slide that open and have uh, great uh, openness and ventilation. Uh, but the rest of it has, you can see some of the same pr almost prairie style interior character that Wright and his other you know contemporaries were doing so there's there's definitely some crossover happening here here's another view of that same room with the with the window wall opened up there um, you can see the track here where you you know where you slide open these windows there is a fireplace you know he's got that from right as well um, you can see sort of uh, his own furniture design here there's a chair that uh, um, doesn't look any more comfortable than some of Wright's chairs, frankly. A lot of clear story windows uh, with some overhangs to let in light, but not too much with that intense California sun. Uh, and he did some other work. This is another example of a project from 1926. This is the Lovell Beach House. Uh, this is at New Newport Beach, California. So this is um, really, you know, probably at the time, it probably had a great beach view uh, almost across the street. It's, I'm sure it's more closed in now. I haven't seen this personally yet, but um, it's, it's, what it's doing, though, is it's really breaking away now. We're starting to see um, Schindler move away from that early prairie-style influence like we saw at his own house and really embracing more of the concepts of European modernism. Um, that you know he would have been learning a bit before he emigrated, and certainly would have seen in publications uh, because he was from Vienna. He could have easily read, wrote, uh, read the German you know literature and magazines. So you know he would have been familiar with Corbusian concepts and the five points. Uh, we see pillow tees more or less. We see you know ribbon windows here. You know, this is, um, you know, concrete construction, flat roof. You could have a roof garden. We've got decks that stick out for, uh, you know, for roof decks and things like that. So we're really seeing a Corbusian concept here, um, even before the, the Villa Savoy. This actually predates Villa Savoy, but uh, Cobu has already, in the early 20s, published his concept of the five points and what modern architecture should be. So we're seeing more of that in European influence here uh, at the Lovell Beach House. Here's a nice historic view of it. Um, and this, you know, it made a lot of sense to lift the main living space up off the ground because that would have given a better view to the ocean and to the sets and everything. Um, and down below is just sort of open carport. So you would come in, you'd walk up, there's a, there's a main living level, and then you come up here and there's, you know, uh, bedrooms all along in that upper level there.
here's a floor plan of that. So you see the pillow tee the, of the piers of the pillow tees here and sort of where carports are. And then you've got stairs that lead up to a main open living area, uh, living and dining room are essentially combined with maybe just a small divider between them, which is something we were seeing both when rights planning and in the early European modernist planning. Uh, and then the next architect I want to talk about is Richard Neutra. So Neutra is another Austrian architect. Uh, he had trained and worked uh, for Adolf Luce. If you remember, we talked about Luce and his um, uh, his projects and his philosophy. He he all he eschewed ornament altogether, right? He was one of the fairly really earliest European modernists to say reject ornament completely and just allow the building and its materials to be the decorative elements. Um, so he immigrates to the U.S. in 1923, and he came to L.A. and was living and working with Rudolf Schindler for a time, uh, and then somewhat, you know, ironically would go on and really sort of outshine. His career would far surpass Schindler's. Uh, there, eventually, I think there was a lot of jealousy between them. Uh, but or especially on Schindler's part, uh, because he had kind of mentored this guy, and then you know the the mentee, you know, really got a bigger career and and sort of outshone uh, him. But uh, he he becomes one of the premier early modernists in America and really helped set the tone for modernism. So much so that his work is included in the MoMA exhibition that we'll talk about in 1932, where Schindler was ignored. <laughs> so that was part of the jealousy that occurred there. Uh, but in the early days, this is um, Schindler and Neutra and Schindler's wife and child uh, living at the house. They they all lived there uh, together uh, for a time. And, you know, uh, uh, Neutra had a wing and he helped, you know, build the place, um, you know, uh, over time. Uh, and they were pretty close. And certainly uh, Neutra would have learned a lot about architecture and design from Schindler uh, and just, you know, became really better at it and was probably a better businessman at getting clients and that sort of thing. Um, they had known each other back in Vienna. So, you know, they, there was a connection there. And uh, so there's, you know, this, it's this insular community of, of, of one person aiding another and it all sort of goes to Frank Lloyd Wright, but then it, you know, it's like a family tree, right? It just sort of spreads out from there. So, one of the things that probably caused some jealousy is this project. Um, same name, uh, the Lovell family hires Neutra to design their house in 1929. Um, Schindler had done their beach house. This is their main house that they have built up on one of the, in the foothills overlooking Hollywood and Beverly Hills. I mean, it's a pretty shishi area here. And, um, they hire Neutra. They don't hire Schindler, who had already done a project for him, you know, pretty successfully, I guess. But um, they wind up hiring Neutra instead to do the main house. So that shows you both, uh, you know, how far Neutra advances. Um, and we see a lot of the same planning concepts. Uh, Neutra also embraces the Corbusian uh, Bauhaus philosophy, uh, you know, of pilotes, of ribbon windows and the flat uh, roofs and, um, you know, even garden garden decks and that sort of thing. All, you know, almost all the five points are really included here in the Lovell House uh, in L.A. Uh, this is a historic view during construction and to show you that this is a steel framed house. Steel framing was not a, new, not a new innovation. We talked about it, right, with the Chicago School and the development of skyscrapers and, you know, commercial buildings and so forth. But it hadn't really been used in residential construction. Um, you know, most houses were still, you know, stick built frame houses, wood frame, uh, and you could cover it with clapboard or you could cover it with stucco um, or you could build a brick, you know, and even um, eventually started building frame houses and just veneered it with brick. Uh, but to use a, a commercial steel frame construction type uh, was pretty new and innovative and shows you that 
residential architecture, modernist residential architecture is becoming, right, the, the lines between residential and commercial architecture are going to really begin to blur uh, amongst the architects working in this genre. And they really see them as just variations on the same theme of, of structure, of form, and massing. It doesn't matter. You can make it a commercial building, you can make a factory building, or you can make it a house. Um, and so I like to show this because clearly, you know, this is the one of the clearest, earliest examples of that philosophy. Here are the floor plans. It's a multi-level house, as I say, as you saw in that one image. It sits up on the hillside of, of the foothills overlooking Hollywood. And so they're up at the top is the entrance level. You come in um, and come into an entry foyer, and then you actually walk down the stairs to the main living level. So there's a big living room, dining room combination, uh, and library, and there is no divider between them. Uh, it's one big open space. So there, he's taking Wright's open plan concept even beyond what Wright had been doing uh, to where you know he had dividers like chimney or fireplace mass dividing spaces. This is just one open space, um, you know, combined together. And again, we take that advantage or we take that for granted now with big great rooms and all that kitchen family room all together, you know, but. This, this was still pretty radical planning, uh, residential planning at the time. But the bedrooms are actually on the upper floor. And then down below, there's some, you know, servant spaces and a pool deck and that sort of thing. So I got to tour this. This was really exciting uh, when I was in L.A. a few years ago for the Frank Lloyd Wright conference. We toured this. And, oh, there's, there's the... Um, uh, the observatory, the Griffith Observatory. So that gives you a little sense of things. You see that in you know, movies a lot. Um, anyway, so here is the entry sequence. So you come, you almost walk across a bridge, right, uh, to the entrance, which is rather diminutive. It's not a, you know, hit you in the face kind of entry. So it still has that concept that Wright developed of, right, of a hidden entry, of not, you know, making it a grandiose, you know, public entrance way. Uh, but you can sort of see off to the left the way the house, you know, the way the ravine, you know, goes down and the way the house also goes down the hillside as well. And you can see the structural framing that are almost like the pilotis holding up some of the upper levels of the house here. So here's a view from um, uh, on the side of the hill, so you get a little better view of the entire house here. Here you can see some of these pilotes, and we can see as you go down into the living level area here, it becomes more and more glazed. We come, you know, almost an entirely glazed wall in certain areas, and in other areas we have this, you know, cast concrete form. So, uh, and then we can see some of the roof decks as well. So all, almost essentially all of the concepts of the five points that Kabu had uh, put forward as necessary for a modern house are, are included here at the Lovell House. Uh, so this is an, uh, a view of the living room looking towards the library. Uh, this is the stair that comes down and descends into this main living level here. And so the only thing dividing the living from the library is a couple of steps. Uh, and a change in flooring material. That's it. You know, that's the only thing that lets you know that you're in a different space. And then these are a couple of views. Uh, on the left is a view of the stair frame coming down, just a slab of a wall dividing the stair from the living room. And then on the right view, uh, which is almost just turned at a slight angle from the camera position, is a view of the fireplace. Uh, and you can see here that it's you know just plain, unadorned surfaces. Um, no ornamentation here, other than a little bit of decoration that is provided by the, by the brick at the fireplace. And then this is a view looking in the living room towards the dining room off in the distance there. And you can see how the wall just opens up. It's completely glazed uh, with an incredible view right down into the Los Angeles Valley. And you can open all of these windows to get amazing you know, ventilation. And here's the view. Um, you know, interestingly, there's a, you know, 
uh, Barcelona chair in there, a Mesian Barcelona chair in there that the current family is, uh, actually there's still descendants of the Lovell family live here, but um, you, you really get uh, a sense of taking advantage of the site and of the vistas and using these glazed walls to maximize that. So Neutra, got to show you his own house um, uh, in uh, um, Spring Lake, uh, part of Los Angeles, uh, is the VDL, he calls it the VDL Research House. It's really his home and studio. Um, so you can, if asked on a quiz, you can correctly answer either VDL Research House or Neutra Home and Studio. Uh, this dates from 1932 with many modifications over time. Um, again, this was his, it was a research house. He was trying out things, he was experimenting. And so there's a lot of, you know, changes that are ongoing, just like Wright was doing in his home and studio uh, up until the time he left in 1909. Uh, so this is also um, my photograph. It was, um, it has a bridge that goes from the sidewalk across a little sort of pond of water to an entry area here. Uh, and then there's a lot going on here. There's, there are vertical fins that are sunshades. There's deep overhanging eaves that help to shade the band of windows here. Um, there's, um, there's some elements of Mesian uh, or excuse me, of Corbu's uh, five points, although this doesn't really set up on pilotis the way uh, the Lovells did. Uh, but we still see the, you know, the freeform exterior. We still see the banded windows. Um, and as we'll see, uh, it's a pretty much a freeform interior as well with a structural frame uh, that, that holds the house up. Here's a historic view, uh, almost the same view. And again, on the right, we see these vertical fins that are sunshades that, that can be adjusted to provide you know, shading to this glazed wall here, uh, but still allow light to go. So there's a lot of uh, incorporation of technology. And I mean, you know, uh, green technology, sustainable architecture. This is this is 1932, and a lot of the concepts that we use today in sustainable architecture, uh, passive houses, etc., are are present here in this 1932 house. Here's another historic view. That's Nortra sitting on one of his roof decks. Uh, we see a huge glazed wall along here, and notice on the roof is. A lot of water. This is a, uh, a a technology that was really common in the mid 20th century, in which you create the roof like a bathtub, and you would have standing water that would provide an uh, essentially like an insulation to the roof. Um, it was a technology that isn't used anymore because the roof would leak. Uh, you know, eventually sealant joints would fail. You get roof leaks. I lived in an apartment in Springfield right out of college, and it had it was dated from the 1950s, and it had that technology. And sure enough, I got a leak in my kitchen ceiling one day, and, um, you know, I called the landlord and everything, and he had it fixed and all that. And he said, yeah, uh, this this happens every so often because, the you know, the tech the, the roof is literally like a bathtub and it's meant to hold water on top of it. I'm like, what? <laughs> I didn't even know about that at that time. Uh, so here you see that uh, there. And uh, I don't know if they even still do this uh, on the house here because it, uh, it's, it ultimately it, it fails. So here's a floor plan. It's a really complicated floor plan. The, the entry and the front that I was showing you is over here on the left. So the street is like out here on the left here. And then this is the concrete sort of bridge that spans across to the entrance right here. And then these are the fins, the vertical fins that I was showing you uh, that sort of shade this guest room here on the main level and another room up on the upper level. Uh, so you come in and there's, uh, there's a lot of open courtyard. This is an open courtyard area here, which again in LA is usually opened up and becomes a circulation space and even an outdoor living space. Uh, but if not, then you can sort of circulate through other parts to get back here to the living room. 
Uh, there's bedrooms here. There's a you know open you know glazed wall here, and then there's a staircase that leads up that I have a photo of. Here's that photo of that staircase, completely open plank, open tread stair. Um, there, there's no risers. It's just a pure structural element that is decorative in itself. It's you know one doesn't need to apply ornamentation to this to make it look really cool. And you can see the way we have glazed walls and you know, here's a part of the outdoor courtyard area with brick pavers. Um, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a hard house to show uh, because it is so complicated. Here's another view of that. You can see the staircase there sort of inside that glazed courtyard. And this is uh, one of the um, sort of office library spaces. You can see some of his furniture uh, and the, the openness, the, again, the glazed walls that we saw at the Lovell House. All right. Um, next, I want to talk about Neutra's uh, Kaufman House. This is a uh, historic view of this. This is in Palm Springs, California from 1947. Uh, so this is later. This is almost mid-century modern architecture, but uh, it's a continuation and an evolution of his style. Uh, and this is a very famous photograph by Julia Schulman uh, of the house soon after it was built and really helped to popularize both this modernist architecture, but also Palm Springs as a uh, wealthy getaway for uh, for people in LA. Um, it's you know it's this desert landscape, really beautiful with the mountains in the distance, and we see Palm Springs is really known for a plethora of modernist architecture by wealthy patrons, you know Hollywood moguls and stuff that um, hired architects like Neutra to design. Uh, summer houses or country houses for them out here in the desert. Uh, so here's a more contemporary view of it. And we're still seeing some of the same principles. This doesn't set up on pilates. Uh, we don't see all the concrete construction. Uh, this is becoming more of a, just a steel and glass building, uh, more of the Mesian principles that we were starting to see a little bit of and we'll certainly talk more about when he moves, when we talk about his career here in the United States. Uh, but you can see there's just all glazed openings, many of which slide open, just like we saw both at Via Savoy by Corbu and at uh, Via Tugendat by Mies. Um, and so here's just a little more information. You know, people like Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy David Jr., Bob Hope, they would all, you know, build houses out here in Palm Springs, um, you know, and they like the dry air, they like getting away from LA and stuff. So, you know, it's like, people today like to have a getaway house if you can afford it. Um, and so uh, this, this really became a center for, for modernism. Uh, but the other thing I want to talk to you about is the Kaufman family is going to be very important because they also commissioned another great architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, to design their house, a, 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 another getaway house for them. Uh, so this is a really rare example where we have one client design, uh, hire two of the most famous architects to design two of the most important, significant modern buildings of the 20th century. Uh, so this is one of them. Uh, I showed you the, the other one at the, the title slide, which is Falling Water uh, from 1936. But look at the plant. As modern as this is, as Mesian and, and principles of Corbusier and all of that, you look at the plant and it's still a Frank Lloyd Wright plant. It's a pinwheel design with right here in the center is the fireplace. So even after all this time, 1947, Neutra still has the planning principles that he probably saw in the Vosmuth portfolio by Frank Lloyd Wright. And just a few views. This is one of the bedrooms. And you know, when you you know, when you have a, a private estate in Palm Springs, you can have a glass house. You can open those up, and you know, that's the way to live. <laughs> I guess <laughs> not many of us can afford that, but.
All right, so let's talk about MoMA from 1932. So this is an exhibition prepared by Philip Johnson, somebody we're going to talk a little more about later, and Henry Russell Hitchcock. Uh, they are the curators of this exhibition, and it is put forth in 1932. Uh, it's, a, it's a museum exhibition, but they also produce a catalog, and the catalog can be published for anyone who doesn't attend the uh, exhibition in person. And so this becomes a really critical moment in American architectural history because this really introduces the international style or this modernist architecture that was developing in Europe and in Southern California to the masses, to average people who attended the exhibition, but also to the architects either attending the exhibition or looking at the catalog just the way the Vosmuth portfolio introduced modern architecture to Europeans, the exhibition 1932 helps to introduce this style of architecture to architects all across America. Um, so here's, a, here's an image of uh, one of the galleries and right front and center and on some of the walls you see Via Savoy. Hopefully you recognize that. Uh, so this is you know, certainly one of the highlights uh, they featured Corbusier, they featured Ms. van der Rohe, they featured Walter Gropius, um, all of the people we've been talking about, and most of the projects we've been talking about are put on display here at this. And in fact, the, the term, or the, you know, what we call international style, is coined from this show um, that uh, Henry Russell Richcock and Philip Johnson say, well, let's call this the international style. Uh, and it sticks, and that's what we still refer to as this kind of movement of architecture. So here are some of the prints from the catalog. So on the left, Millard House, um, La Miniatura from Pasadena that I showed you uh, earlier. On the right, Walter Gropius, the Bauhaus in Dessau. Um, Via Savoy. The Mies van der Rohe Pavilion, all these buildings are featured in this exhibition. And so this is, this is what people saw and said, wow, you know, we, I want to do more of this. Uh, as well as some others. Uh, again, here on the right is Neutra's Lovell House that we just talked about. You can see the very barren hills. You know, now these are all covered by houses now. But uh, but on the left is uh, a project we didn't talk about, How on the Skies, uh, the Philadelphia Savings Fund building, uh, which had just been finished uh, when the exhibition was put on, a steel and glass skyscraper, uh, one of the very first in the United States anywhere uh, you know, we, we saw the Chicago School buildings, uh, which, which really created the modern form of the skyscraper, uh, but they were still using a lot of masonry, a lot of terracotta and all that. This is becoming more of a steel and glass skyscraper uh, that, that Mies van der Rohe had envisioned in the early 20s, but didn't have a client and didn't have the technologies to actually build yet. Now, 1931, Somebody, some how in Lascaux find a client and have the technologies to actually build one. All right, so back to Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, as I alluded to just a, a minute ago with the Kaufman House in uh, by Neutra in Palm Springs, the Kaufman family also hires the other great 20th century architect, Frank Lloyd Wright, to design another getaway house for them, um, Falling Water, what would become known as Falling Water. This Bear Run, Pennsylvania, it's a remote uh, mountainous region south of Pittsburgh and was completed in 1936. So here is the Kaufman family. So uh, Edgar Kaufman Sr. was a department store mogul. He ran Kaufman's department store in Pittsburgh. and. Um, quite wealthy, that's his wife, and then his son, Junior, uh, was interested in architecture and design. And he actually uh, became an apprentice for Frank Lloyd Wright at his Taliesin school, which I'll mention later. Um, and when his dad and mom and dad said, hey, we want to have a weekend house, you know, out uh, outside of Pittsburgh, he said, I know just the architect. Let's hire you know, let's hire Frank Lloyd Wright. And they said, well, okay, we'll give it a shot. And uh, what they got was probably the most significant work of architecture of the 20th century. 
So here is Wright. Um, I showed you the houses that he did in LA in the early 20s. Uh, and that was about it. Um, at, by the mid-1920s, which was a booming time in America, Wright's career really began to falter. Um, he had some personal issues. He had gotten married and, uh, uh, well, actually, he, the woman he ran off with, Mae Machene, uh, he ran to, off to Europe with, um, she was brutally murdered along with her two children from her first marriage uh, at Taliesin by the cook who went on a psychotic rampage while Wright was away in Chicago doing some work on Midway Gardens. Um, he, this, this guy killed Mama Cheney, her two young children, and several of the people working for Wright up at Taliesin. Um, really tragic thing. It made national headlines all across the country and um, really devastated Wright. Uh, he went through some real personal crises, um, married a woman sort of almost that he hardly knew uh, as a, a kind of a, you might say a rebound, I guess. Uh, and that just was a terrible mistake on his part. Uh, that, you know, that disintegrated. Um, he, he had always lived above his means. He spent money much faster than he could bring it in, even though he was a pretty successful architect. Um, he still had his, you know, first wife and children to support. Uh, you know, he just had any number of problems. So by the mid twenties, his, his career seemed over. And he did, uh, uh, his, his third wife, Oglavana, uh, you know, helped encourage him and said, well, why don't you, you know, use Taliesin and start a, a school and have people, you know, you, you can train them in your philosophies and principles of architecture. And that's what began the apprentice uh, of Taliesin in 1932. And it really helped him survive because it, you know, these... <laughs> Uh, Wright was always known for not paying his employees in a very timely manner. Uh, some of you who talked about architects that had worked for Wright, uh, some of them left Wright's office because he didn't pay them. Uh, well, this was sort of reversing that. He actually found out that people would pay him to work for him uh, under the guise of learning from him, right, as a school. And, and so uh, it was a pretty brilliant move on his part. Uh, and so that's how he, you know, this Edgar Kaufman Jr. He became an apprentice for him, and um, there he is on the left. And he works, um, introduces him to his father here on the right to build um, uh, to build this summer house for the Kaufman family. So the it's located in a mountainous region south of Pittsburgh, and uh, the it, Kaufman family owned this property, and a and a little creek had was going through it. And there were some dramatic waterfalls, and they love to come out here in the summertime and, and you know, splash around in the water and, you know, lay on the rocks to sun themselves and watch the waterfall. And so when it came time to build this little weekend house, uh, they said, right, you know, we, we love this waterfall, and we want a house that really appreciates the waterfall. And they expected, right, that uh, that the house would have an incredible vista of the waterfall that they enjoyed looking at when they would come out. Um, but they didn't exactly get that, right? They got something completely different. They got a house over the waterfall, uh, right? Incorporated the house organically, rising out of the rocks uh, that made up this dramatic waterfall. And it, it blew their minds, and it blew everybody else's minds who's ever looked at this. Um, it was, Wright had always wanted his architecture to be a part of nature and to be a part of the landscape. That's why he designed these long, low-slung horizontal houses at the Prairie School, because he wanted them to sort of spread out across the open, flat prairie. This isn't an open, flat prairie. This is a hill, rocky hillside with a waterfall coming down. And he said, I want my house to be a part of that. Uh, and so that's exactly what he did. So the house cantilevers out over this famous waterfall that they had enjoyed uh, living in. And he uses the natural stone of the site to build up the, the sort of mass and core of the house. And then he cantilevers uh, these stucco balconies out over that. And so literally the house overhangs the waterfall. And, and also the striations, right? The, 
can go back. The natural rock striations, these horizontal, you can even see the cantilever of the waterfall here. He's mimicking that in his architecture. I mean, it's, it's, it's just an amazing, I cannot tell you how incredible and amazing this place is, and this design is. So here is the fireplace in the main living room. And these are some of the natural rocks that were on the site in their same location. And these are the rocks that the Kaufmans like to lay out on and sun themselves. And Wright said, okay, now they're going to be the, the hearth of your home. So he's still got that concept of the hearth as the heart of the home, and he's incorporated these important rocks into that spot. It, it, just incredible what he was able to do with this site. And here's a view. This is actually a front on the walkway approach the house. So it's a bridge, and the water, you know, the stream goes under the bridge. And you can see how it goes underneath the cantilever of the main living room. And then you can walk down a set of stairs to a little landing platform. And you can sit here and dangle your feet in the water. Or you could jump in the water. You know, they like to go in the water on a, on a hot summer day. And so this was how you'd get down into the water. Or you could just sit there and dangle, sit there with your feet dangling in the water as it, you know, as it washes over your feet. Here's a floor plan. So the bridge uh, that the that I just uh, that the photo was taken from, I took that photo, uh, is here, and you're looking over here to the main living room here, and this is the staircase that descends down to Bear Run itself. And then the entryway has to be hidden. You kind of come across. You actually enter from the rear of the site into the main living space here. So here's a view from the back side. This there's a uh, you can see some of the natural rock formations and how Wright just takes that same stone and creates even sort of natural uh, striations of the rock that you see on the site. And another view of the living room, uh, open plan concept here, lots of glazing. Uh, you know, looking out to the natural landscape. You know, this is a weekend house. This is just a getaway house. And so he, he wants to immerse the Kaufmans in nature while they're here. So this, is, this reintroduces Frank Lloyd Wright to the world and to America. Um, this is the cover of Time magazine from 1938. Uh, there's Wright, there's Falling Water, and really revives his career, which truly had been faltering. And this is the middle of the Depression. You know, it's the mid-30s. We're in the height of the Depression. Not a lot of architecture is being built. And so for for, to, to find a client like the Kaufmans that can afford to build a weekend house or anything, afford to build anything in the Depression, uh, and to do something as incredible as Falling Water uh, just makes Wright the most famous architect in the world. And truly is what helps to establish him is really probably one of the greatest architects that ever lived. Uh, so a couple other projects I want to just highlight before we move on. Here's uh, Taliesin West. Uh, this is in Scottsdale, Arizona from 1937. So I didn't really show you Taliesin in Wisconsin. Um, I encourage you to go visit it sometime. It's an open um, you know, house museum that you can visit. Uh, he had established that after he left Oak Park. Um, and, you know, this is where he established his school in 1932, but he really fell in love with the Arizona desert, especially in wintertime, like so many people do. And so starting in 1937, he creates Taliesin West. Uh, and so in winter, the school and rights would move to this location in Scottsdale, and then they would be in, uh, in Wisconsin in the spring and the fall. Uh, so here is a plan of the complex. We see strong geometries. Right now at this point is gone beyond the sort of pinwheel design and sort of the ge geometries of squares and rectangles to triangles, to circles. We saw that a little bit on the mantle of the Hollyhock House. Uh, now we're seeing it in his architecture, literally. This is a historic view of it. Uh, Scottsdale at this time was a remote desert outpost. Phoenix was like, what, 20 miles away or something like that. Uh, and nowadays, uh, all, almost all the way up to the edge of the boundary of the Taliesin complex is all housing. 
it's it's completely different. Even in Wright's lifetime, uh, it was changing dramatically, and he was really very disappointed that you know that suburbia was coming up to his doorstep. Uh, but you can see it's just dramatically set along the mountains here, and the it sprawls out across the desert landscape, and the construction, as we see here, incorporates the natural desert landscape. Uh, look at the concrete rubble stone piers here, and then look at the mountain behind. It's the natural stones on the site form, put into molds and then poured with concrete, but allowing these big boulders to be exposed and revealed so that it looks like it's organic to the site. And then the frame construction literally was canvas in its early days. It's now a more permanent sort of skylight and, um, uh, you know, glazed construction. But in its earliest days, it was just open canvas uh, to the desert because, you know, you live in the desert in the winter and you can enjoy the, the fresh air and the, the warm temperatures. Here's a more close-up view of the concrete form or, you know, uh, masonry here. Uh, so you see this desert stone that was natural to the site. And then you see the, you know, sort of left exposed and raw in the, you know, with the cement formed around that. And then the angle of this wood beam mimics the angles of the mountains all around it. Here's another detail view. Uh, and again, you can see that the stone, it really helps to blend into the desert landscape all around it. This is, this is really one of his greatest works of organic architecture, um, hands down, of really creating a building that is of its site. This can't be just plopped anywhere. It wouldn't fit. He wanted architecture, like we saw at Falling Water, uh, to emerge out of its unique individual site. And that's still one of the greatest things about Wright's work. Uh, and we see it here at Taliesin West. There's a nice view of one of the clear story windows in the drafting room. There's a historic view of the drafting room. Um, here's Wright with some of his apprentices, um, you know, staged, of course, you know, all looking, you know, at the, the great master working here, you know, but, uh, you know, he, he, he had no shortage of ego, uh, to be sure. Uh, he, he earned it. <laughs> he, he was a great architect, but he, uh, he never let you know that, uh, uh, never let you forget that he was a great architect. <laughs> Here's, uh, this is on one of the tours. I took this photo in one of the sort of living room spaces, and you can see the angle of the wood beams, uh, this used to be canvas uh, on the top here. Now it's more of a sort of plexiglass uh, to, to be more permanent, uh, but you can get a sense of the space and the quality of light and all that he's trying to kind of mimic here, almost tent-like forms that he's trying to, to kind of create that character. There. And another great project is not too far from here in Racine, Wisconsin. This is the Johnson Wax Company headquarters uh, from 1939. Uh, here's a great view of it. It has a research tower uh, that literally was built uh, a few years later, but it was built to be where all the uh, research for their products, uh, Johnson Wax products, would be built. And then behind it, sprawling out, is the corporate headquarters itself. A very different kind of architecture we see here than, you know, Falling Water or um, Taliesin West, and it's a different site. It's a different environment. But what he does here is he does an amazing uh, structural innovation. Uh, he wants an open, really open office environment, uh, which again is something that wasn't really common yet. It's it's pretty ordinary in post-World War II construction, but was a really still pretty radical idea in 1939. Um, but he didn't just want ordinary columns, and so he developed these cast concrete columns that would sort of mushroom out at the top. And, you know, at the top is where you're trying to support a lot of load. And so it's this wide disc that transfers the load to this kind of wider co conical shape here. Uh, and then it and then it comes down almost to a to almost to a point. Uh, it's almost like a woman's high heel. Right. You know, it's got a big, broad spot at the top for for the heel itself, for the foot. Uh, and then it gets narrower and narrower all the way down to a point. And it can support a woman's weight. Right. 
uh, it, just with that point at the end. It's the exact same technology, um, really. But it was so new and so radical when this was done that the that the building inspector would not approve this. He said, I don't think this will work. And he actually made them do a, a mock-up and load up. They did one column. They supported it, you know, so it wouldn't fall over. And they loaded it up with sandbags. I don't know if I have a photo of that. Uh, I'm not sure if I have a photo of it or not. They loaded up on top with sandbags, got to the point where um, they they had enough load on there that that met the design criteria, and the building inspector said, "Okay, I'm convinced. I'll let you do this." And then Wright said, "Let's keep going. Let's see how much more it could weight." And I think they got to like two times the amount of weight. Uh, that was required it could support before it finally failed. So, you know, he really proved that this was uh, a, a, an incredible structural innovation here. So here is the floor plan, uh, and this is the main space we see in this rectangle here, and the circles with the dots are those columns, and that really allowed for this open office environment. And here's a detail of that. Uh, in between the discs, he has another really innovative material. It's Pyrex tubes. Um, if you think of a Pyrex dish or a Pyrex measuring cup, and you probably have in your kitchen, same technology, um, but he created these tubes, glass tubes of it, and then he formed them together with a sealant in between to create skylights and uh, and a clear story window that you see off in the distance. Really innovative technology, so innovative that, of course, it leaked. <laughs> the sealant didn't work too well in the 1930s, and there were a lot of leaks in this. Nowadays, we can do pretty modern sealants, and it's much more, um, you know, much more watertight, but it, it was almost too innovative at the time. Here's the entrance, uh, again, with these um, sort of mushroom high heel point uh, columns. Uh, this is the furniture he designed uh, for the complex, uh, the desk, and a three-legged, on the left is a three-legged stool. And the women, mostly women, who worked in the, you know, office pool as you know, secretaries, administrative people, etc., um, they were expected to have good posture, and this three-legged stool was to sort of force them to keep that good posture while they worked. Um, they fell over all the time. You can imagine during the day, <laughs> if their posture uh, failed even a little bit, they would fall over. <laughs> and so uh, Johnson Wax Company said, okay, well, enough of that. We can't have our knees continually falling over and knocking their heads on the desk. So they finally introduced a four-legged stool that we see on the left here, or on the right side. Um, but, um, you know, it was, it was another one of Wright's crazy ideas of, of really uncomfortable furniture. Uh, here's the research tower uh, that was added uh, just a few years later, and it has the same Pyrex tubes to create the glazing for that, uh, for the walls there. There's a detail of that. You can see the horizontal lines. Those are all individual Pyrex tubes with a, just a bead of sealant in between. Uh, like I say, it didn't look, work too well at the beginning, but um, they've got it better. It's, this tower has been really nicely restored now, and you can actually tour it. It's no longer used because it only had one means of egress. Um, it was a very small footprint, um, uh, but it uh, was pretty innovative uh, space at the time. Uh, Wright really saw this as a tree. Uh, and it had a solid trunk in the center that would be the core for the elevator and the stair and for plumbing chases, and then branches that would cantilever out uh, that would be like the branches of the tree. Uh, here it is under construction, so you can really see how it worked, um, you know, of these cantilevered forms uh, interspersed between a rectangle and a circle. And open in between. And so if you're working in the circle, you could actually look down to the to the square level down below you or vice versa. So it helped to engage interaction between the different uh, groups uh, and scientists that were working here. And in this historic view, uh, with the light just right, you can actually see shadowy forms through the Pyrex tubes to see how the structure worked. And this is a historic view of it. Um, so, you know, here's a circular elevator, uh, another pretty crazy idea. Uh, 
probably didn't work too well. Uh, and then, um, you know, this, this laboratory space uh, within that. Um, and also in the 1930s, starting in 36 and then throughout the rest of his career when he dies in 1959, he, he creates a new style of residential architecture that he called Usonian. Um, this was meant to be a, a truly American architecture. Prairie style was too, uh, but, but really, you know, he's gone off on something different. And by the 30s, he wants a true U.S. style. Usonian is sort of a play on U.S. architecture. Um, and um, the first one that I'll show you is the Jacobs House in Madison, Wisconsin. This is from 1936. And there are some elements left over from prairie style here, some of the flat uh, cantilevered eaves that are deep overhangs. We see that a little bit, but there's not the emphasis on horizontality that we saw with the prairie style. Um, the open plan is here that we saw originally with the prairie style, but we see a lot more glazing, the full glazed wall here of the living room. Um, we still see the sort of plan, I think, yeah, here's a floor plan. We still see that sort of meandering floor plan with a fireplace or the hearth being the heart of the home right here. Um, and it spreads out beyond that. He gets into some crazy geometries, um, circles and hexagons and triangles as the basis of geometries. This is just a, a simple rectangular grid here. Uh, but some of these houses, I've been in a lot of these Usonian houses, and a lot of them are really funky spaces. Not all of them are particularly successful as spaces, uh, in my opinion. But ultimately, he built, um, he designed around 60 uh, unique Usonian houses all across the country. People would write him and say, right, I want you to design a house for me in, you know, Timbuktu, Iowa, and he would do that. So. They were meant to be more affordable for families. Um, you know, average, more middle-class families were meant to do the, uh, be able to build these. They were still pretty expensive. Um, there are a little, a lot of high-end Usonian houses, but there's still some more modest ones that he did. This is an interior view of the living room of the Jacobs house. And then lastly is the Guggenheim Museum, one of his most famous, most recognizable works. And really, one of the last projects he worked on uh, at his death in 1959. Uh, this is in New York City. Uh, the Guggenheims, uh, you know, were very, very wealthy and uh, great collectors of art. And um, Mrs. Guggenheim uh, and Solomon Guggenheim really worked a lot with Wright to um, to do a, a number of projects, but this one being the most important here. Um, it's the distinctive concrete spiral. Uh, this shows the contemporary view of it with a, a more modern addition off in the background here, but I think I've got some historic views of this as well. This is taking the concept of Unity Temple and uh, 50 years later, what, what that would be. It's, it's cast concrete. Um, it's now uh, eliminated all ornamentation, um, you know, but, and it's very insular just the way Unity Temple was. Uh, because if you're in an art museum, you need to focus on the art, not on the views outside, just the way that when you're in Unity Temple, you should be focused on the, the preaching, the minister and the pulpit, not on the views outside. So a lot of the same planning principles are here, the, the, the massing and the geometries, uh, in this case, a sort of sur spiral geometry, um, but clearly something completely different. He's not mimicking, he's not copying. He didn't take Unity Temple and say, hey, I got something successful, I'm just gonna keep doing that the rest of my career. He's, he's really innovated and uh, remains very innovative throughout the rest of his career so that even though there's so, so, so many similarities between this and Unity Temple, they're completely different buildings, completely different designs. Uh, some of the details of the, the spiraling here. So the way this museum works is different than most museums. You come in, you go through your ticketing, and you, you the first thing you do is you take an elevator to the very top, and then you walk down a spiral ramp all the way down to the bottom, and the galleries are on a linear, are on that linear spiral. 
So unlike many museums where you walk in and you get lost almost right away, right? You know, you need the map that they give you uh, in order to find your way around to the galleries. This isn't a massive museum like the Art Institute, but still it is a very simple um, planning or, or, or sort of circulation pattern. And, it's, and the spiral is reflected, that that use of space is completely reflected by the massing and the form on the outside. This is going all the way back to, to Louis Sullivan and the lessons that Wright learned of uh, form ever follows the function from Louis Sullivan. This is a perfect example of form follows function here because you see the spiral and that's exactly what you do when you get inside this building. So here's, the, here's an interior view of it um, standing on the top and you would come out of the elevator and you would just walk down this ramp all the way, all the way down to the bottom and then you get to this grand space. And in the center is this incredible open atrium that allows you to get views of the art from different angles and perspectives. You can see the people. It's, it's an incredible space. It's a terrible thing way to show art because there are no straight walls. <laughs> there, the well, outside wall is curved and the floor is angled. Uh, so trying to put a rectangular painting on a curved angled wall, not so easy to do. So that's the criticism that most people have of the Guggenheim, I suppose. But um, it's still an incredible work of architecture. Here's the skylight up at the top. And uh, to close off, that's a, a photo. Unfortunately, uh, Melissa and I got to go to an uh, to a sort of a uh, reception uh, one evening, uh, but they they were in between exhibitions, and so you see the crates and things. Uh, so unfortunately, there was no artwork on display. Uh, but you get a sense of the the space um, and what you you know how you can experience that space view. All right, so that ends uh, the sort of first chapter of American Modernism, and it really helped you know, pretty much closes out our discussions of Frank Lloyd Wright. So he, he, he'll always be there with some of these later architects that we'll be talking about. But, you know, the, we'll, this ends our sort of direct conversation about his works and his designs.